All right, my friends. We are here on a Thursday night, 11 p.m. We got Don Dunn from HD 2020. We got Anthony Gramati. How are you guys doing tonight? I am doing great. Just before we open this, Don just cracked a joke, and I just had to pick myself up off the floor here. So for, forgive me. I'm still laughing. In a world gone mad, Anthony Gramati stands alone, fixing rooms one room at a time. This time, <laughs> it's personal. <laughs> I like that. That's a good premise right there. Good premise for a TV show. Oh, I got that. Ooh, that I, now I do have to point out I'm I'm wearing I'm wearing a shirt with Vespa scooters. Uh, it was a gift from somebody because um, this is important. I, I actually own an old Vespa scooter that has nothing to do with this. But if you ever wonder why the hell is he wearing that weird shirt, that's why. Nice. So you're a pilot and a Vespa scooter owner. Yeah, and guess what's more dangerous? The Vespa scooter. By, and they put, by a long about 40 shot. miles that an hour, is, right? Yeah, no, actually, that go that thing goes. It's a it's a 180 cc one. It goes it goes almost 75 miles per hour with like wheels about this big. Really, right. like, totally death trap. Nice. Uh, that's why you like it. It's the challenge, right? It's the yeah. Risk. I must get all, all the adrenaline that I get from like riding that thing. Like, <laughs> All right, guys, so we want to basically put an end to this amplifier discussion tonight. This is the third part. We have the other two parts that are linked up into the playlist here, so you guys can um, watch that those prior video discussions if you'd like to pick up where we left off. I'm not even sure where we left off in your PowerPoint, yeah, to be honest with you. Factor. Dampening factor. Yeah, I think we covered that, and then we covered the recovery rates of of uh, distortion and all that, all that stuff. So now we're kind of... I think we're at the point where we have to summarize what is a good way to buy an amplifier. Like what should we look at? Um, figuring out our needs, you know, how much power, well, you talk about voltage, but what can we look at at a manufacturer's website specs and gleam at whether or not there's reality there, or if it's just a fairy tale. And yeah. um, as Floyd tool used to say, you often get more useful information off the sidewall of a car tire than you do out of a manufacturer's website with their spe specifications. <laughs> a milk, garden. A, milk garden. That, that is a great statement. And a bunch of my buddies and I are trying to change that to actually come up with um, some stand, some of, yeah, you know, those things on the sidewalls of tires wasn't always there. That evolved over time. If you go back to a tire 30 years ago, there was nothing other than the size of the tire. And, you know, a bunch of good, intended folks got together and defined a thing for traction and mud and snow and all the stuff that helps you know like what can i do with this and um good news is a bunch of bunch of folks uh from from a bunch from from a number of industry backgrounds are trying to standardize this so that you can look look at a spec sheet and go okay i see what i'm getting from this manufacturer i see what i'm getting for that manufacturer what i need is this cool so part of this three-part series that's like taken three hours um is about helping you figure out that stuff. So most, a lot of the things we're going to have talked about the last two sessions and this sessions, you you won't see yet on most manufacturer specs. But if we have our way, if we have our our way in in uh, influencing people, you will see you will see this info. So, do you um, think any of this knowledge will be dropped at CEDIA this year? Is there going to be any announcements about moving yeah. forward with what you're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be one of the, I, we can't talk about it because it's still under under wraps, but there will right. be some announcements at CEDIA about this whole concept. So that's cool. I think this CEDIA this year is going to be a big deal. I mean, you know, because of COVID and, and whatnot. I'm, I'm excited to be there. We're going to yeah. be there. Yep. Hey, Gene, do all of your uh, your followers, your fans, uh, do they know what CD is? We Probably not. I'm not sure if they know what that is. Uh, we do cover it every year, but I don't. We do show reports on C on uh, YouTube. Um, but, geez, what 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 does CD stand for? Maybe you the can say that. Electronics Design and Installation Association. There you go. Right. Spoken for by a true integrator. There you go. So this is the thing that started over 30 years ago. A, a bunch of companies that sold and installed high-end AV gear uh, decided to get together and form an association. And it was all about, hey, you know, how do we how do we come together and share our knowledge? Actually, so so you, you've got competitors coming together and going, look, this is a tiny slice of the industry. We're, we need to share knowledge about how we're doing our stuff. And our stuff being, you know, how how is it that we run wires in the walls and 
follow the, all of the safety and electrical codes? And how is it that we convince a manufacturer that's making projectors to do it so that it works for us rather than just a commercial uh, application? And, um, so a few hundred folks, no, probably just less than a hundred folks got yeah, together yeah. in 1989 in a conference in, in Vegas. I'm giving you more to tell you. Want to know. And they're like, yeah, let's do this thing. First conference was the following year in 1990. I was there. Um, and uh, now it's like, what, 35,000 people or 40,000 people show up at, at the early conference. And mm -hmm. it's cool. Um, a lot of well, great yeah. exchange of ideas. And it's, created, it's created our industry. It really yeah. has it's that standards yeah. and, and training. And my favorite part through the years is the amplifier toss. I just have to say the <laughs> amplifier toss. That's that's entertainment. Hey, can you, right, you know what have about. you been have you done one of those amplifire tosses? I, I mean, man, I did. And, and until they they had like PS audio or somebody had like this insane 180 pound amplifier. Yeah, I've done amplifier toss. I'm just saying that's cool. I, so, I've never heard of that, and I've been to CD oh, a couple yeah, thousand like, times. This is so cool. They, they had the Cindy CD, I think it was called the CDO Olympics, which is all these different very physical things you had to go yeah. through as as an athlete of custom install including crawling through the simulation of an attic where like you yeah. had to like go through all this stuff and see who could get there the fastest you, yeah. you did that i didn't do that Shit, no. didn't do that. so there's all of these and it was for fun you know um so there's all of these things that you had to go through like kind of like a you know at the olympics it was including awesome. the amplifier toss where you had to take this big ass excuse me big hindsight big. Amplifier okay. and toss it kind of like you know if you're doing the um, yeah shot put. The Olympics. yeah and, or, and like this big massive app <sighs> to throw or, it or, 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 throw or it who it. had the who could have the better concert either Jeremy Burkhart at, at uh, Speakercraft or Noli at Monster Cable Jeremy Burkhart had uh, Kid Rock with three thousand people were you there in Denver when he had that it was yep. amazing yeah that I saw was, that I was at the Blue Man Group one I think mm -hmm. that was by Monster of course you were Blue Man Group I was at Kid yeah. Rock. Yeah. Bitches in cages with fire and shit. No, sorry. Oops. Well, it wasn't the same year. That, that was yeah. at Red Rock Canyon, right? So somebody's asking how to CD it different from CES. And I the best way I can answer that is CES used to have roots like CD did back in the day when they were at the uh when they had the you know the separate area, the Venetian, or they or even before that they had the show and they had a whole high end two channel area, but then they just got more into the consumer tech and yeah, they got more focus at the, the yeah. games, yeah, you know, to next generation technology, where Cedia focuses strictly on custom integration. It focuses strictly on home theater, the, you know, the integrated market, um, calibration, that kind of stuff. So it's much more focused into our industry, into the stuff that we cover than CES. I stopped going to CES probably 10 years ago and I never regret not going again. Yeah. And CD, I never miss. Yeah. Uh, and that's a good way to look at it. So, so CS is really about, is actually way more mass market. And it's all about showing product. And CD is more about, yeah. hey, we're coming together, we're talking, we're taking classes, we're giving classes. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot, it's a lot more of a community ar around the companies that like to sell and install and integrate and make stuff work for, for customers. Right. Um, so it's not just about selling some little gizmo that goes blink, you know, the machine that goes ding, um, but it's a lot more about co-learning. That's just, that's the amazing thing about this, about co-learning from each other. I know this sounds completely bizarre. You got people talking to their competitor, telling them, this is how I do it. Uh, it and I, you know, well, why, would, why would you educate your competitor? Because it makes everything better and it just yeah. made the whole industry grow way bigger. It really has. Sitting around having drinks with guys, talking about how we do things and different products that works. I, I've, I've picked up tons of ideas just from my peers at CD. It's always yeah. been a fantastic show to go at. Yeah. I mean, CES is important too. And I think there's a place for both of them. Um, but, but CD is really kind of hyper-focused on, on our industry and what we do. Yeah. And we're going to be doing some really cool things this CD. I'll probably announce it later um, next month or something. But just to give you guys a quick teaser, we're going to be doing some live streaming at CD, and we're going to try to do some education. And Anthony, we very much would like you to be part of that, where we do some uh, kind of virtual trade show coverage at an actual trade show. And Not do to this put you on the spot or anything. Yeah, I'm putting oh, you on the spot yes now. No, right now. I I'm volunteering you. It's too late. I put you on the spot, but, you know. <laughs> Darn. And and you're gonna see me do my 
um, Atmos interpretive dance, which is classic. I've been working on this for a long time. Oh, I, I look forward to seeing yeah. the release of that that piece it's of art. Explaining, explaining. He, all he did a Von Schweikert dance. He did this. He did this I audio did. dance in front of Von Schweikert seventy thousand dollars speakers. Let me tell you something. I wanted to buy the speakers after seeing that. Really, I was, was convinced. I was convinced. And wearing my kilt and everything, so it's great. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> in chocolate. <laughs> Uh, so here we are speaking of chocolate at some point i have to go break and i have to go get the chocolate that i'm going to be eating tonight so let's let's uh let's cut to some of the first slides um this is what to do with spec with with the specifications you see of power amps part three so uh i'm just trying to remember part one was all about the things about voltage and amperage you know what basically how much how much firepower does this thing have yes um and then part two is about kind of how does it drive speakers? And then part three is is what I lo loosely call good behavior. And, and good behavior is, hey, this amplifier does, is it reliable? Does it work well into the typ typical loads I want? You know, is this, is this just a good design, R regardless of how its sound quality is, which is a signal from input to output, is this going to be something that I enjoy having because it's not frustrating? So we're going we're gonna to get into that. Um, so in the world of good behavior, uh, now I'm getting pretty esoteric here, but these things are things that matter. When you listen to one amplifier versus another and you go, why does this sound different? Um, of course, the sales manager is going to say, you know, give you all kinds of very vague um, transparency, transconductance BS. Uh, but here's some real stuff. There's amplifiers that are built with really good phase margin, which is they have the ability to drive a wide range of loads in terms of amplitude and phase rotations and in, in how, how the amplifier is looking at them. And there's amplifiers that have poor phase margin, which means that uh, I, if, I, if we don't want to turn this into a two hour conversation, let's just say that the way the whole design of the amp and its feedback, its feedback loop and everything doesn't tolerate difficult loads. And when it doesn't tolerate it, the amplifier goes becomes an oscillator. And you go, what? Well, so an oscillator is typically, if you actually look at the circuit that it takes to make something become a one megahertz signal generator, it's usually an amplifier driving what's called a tank circuit in the feedback loop. And tank circuit is a combination of uh, inductors, capacitors, resistors. And that's a speaker. You know, you if you if you pretend to be an amplifier looking through the pole the the terminals of a speaker, and you go, "What am I seeing?" You got to yeah. cross over, and there's some I'm going to say random collection of amplifier looking at the terminals of a speaker, and you go, "What am I seeing?" You got to yeah. cross over. Wow, we got some echo. That's weird. Where did that come from? I don't know. From here, um, I'm going to turn my speaker down. Somebody, I'm hearing somebody talking back at me, and it sounds like something I just said. Um, Anyway, and I haven't had the bourbon that Don is working on. What kind of bourbon <laughs> is that, Don? Um, that is Angel's Envy. Mm. Good. Man, I need some of that. Not All right. Happy, um, so pretend you're a power amp. You know, you're, you're driving a speaker, and you look at what, what you're seeing. Really, a power amp doesn't know that at the end of that is a thing that produces sound. It just sees a load, and the load could be modeled in a way as a combination of resistors, uh, capacitors and inductors. And in some conditions, that load becomes an oscillator. And you have to design an amp so that it resists that oscillation. It's called a phase margin. And a poorly behaved amp has a bad phase margin, which, mean that, which means that on some speakers, uh, depending on their impedance character, the thing is just sitting there churning out a, a one or two megahertz that you don't hear because it's way above your hearing. Um, but it's chewing up power. The output devices are doing that. Maybe the bias actually makes it sound better. Maybe it screws it up. Don't really know. And then you change the speaker wire or you change the speaker and the oscillation goes away because you put a speaker wire that's got more resistance uh, or if the oscillation came from inductance, you put a, a wire that's more capacitive or the other way around, suddenly it fixes it and you go, wow, it's magically sounding better because of the speaker wire. No, you just stop the oscillation. So where do you ever see a spec that shows phase margin. You never. don't. I've never, you don't. I've never seen that. No. Um, it is a thing that power amp designers know to worry about, and there's a way to define it. And if all goes right with the work I'm doing with my buddies, both both from Cedia and other uh, things, we'll actually spec that. We'll go, here's a phase margin. 
as in what's the tolerance to difficult loads and uh, an amplifier with a better phase margin will tell you that, hey, this thing will work better most of the time. Another thing in behavior is input impedance. So um, that is when you're feeding something into the amplifier, uh, does it cause any problems from the sources? Does it cause any loading? Does it cause any noise problems? So uh, amplifier designers are caught between having a really high input impedance, which means it's really easy to load, but it also means it may have a lot of noise. Or is it a very low input impedance, which means, hey, there's not going to be a lot of noise in this amplifier, but some source devices may have a hard time driving it. Huh, I've, never, it? I've never run into an amplifier that was low enough input impedance to cause that problem. I, have you seen that in the field? I mean, is I it like esoteric so, brands? Yep. So you get into this philosophy of like, you know, if it's a balanced input, what should it be? Well, as people go, it should be 600 ohms. That's what balanced inputs have always been. Fine. And then you have some products that are built more for mass market that have output resistors, buffer resistors that are one kilo ohm to make sure that if you short circuit the output, nothing goes wrong. Right. So you have a one kill one K output driving a 600 ohm load. Oops. That's a fair amount of drop. And then depending on the wires capacitance, you have a one K resistor driving a hundred picofarads, 200, 500 picofarads, you end up with a high pass, uh, a low pass filter, you lose the highs. And all that sounds really esoteric and bizarre, but it's like you have these differences between the sources and terminations that are not complicated. These are really simple first year of electrical engineering issues that are not well controlled. So um, you you would normally wanna say that the input impedance of a, of a modern amp should be probably somewhere between 1K and 5K, maybe 10K, not higher than that. And that the output impedance of a preamp, a thing that's driving it, should be really no higher than 100 ohms. If you feel like you've got to put a 1K ohm resistor on the output of this, um, you're probably overprotecting yourself. So those are things to look to look for that actually have an enormous influence on the sound. Okay, more important, the output impedance of an amp. What is that? So we talked about this a little bit before, and I have some diagrams, but a, a modern transistor amp, should kind of inherently have a low output impedance, which means that the amplifier can be modeled as a perfect amp with zero output impedances. And as, as you change the load, the, the voltage doesn't change. Somewhere between zero and 0.1 ohms. Uh, that's tolerable. There's amps with a much lower input output impedance, but up to 0 0.05 or 0 0.1 ohms is fine. fine. Well, there are also some tube amps out there which have that warm sound because they glow, that have two ohms of output impedance. Is that a problem? Yeah. Why? You're losing power, basically. Mm -hmm. Why Why are you losing power? It's The, so the amp it's is a 250 voltage. watt amp. It's 250 watts. You got two ohms. Of, who cares? Well, it really depends on the load it's driving because it's like a voltage divider. So an eight ohm load with, with a two ohm output impedance, you're losing about 30% of your power right. across. What about a four yeah. ohm load with a two ohm? Yeah, <clears throat> even output. double that, yeah. What about a speaker? This is great, by the way. The audience, we did not rehearse this, okay? None of this is rehearsed. This is just a conversation between us three. If you ever wonder if, if this was uh, staged. Not at no. all. Why is it not staged? Because we don't got time. All of us, by the time we actually start this thing, are either just finishing dinner, finishing work, we don't have time. But we talk about stuff that makes sense. So here's a funny thing. A speaker is defined as a four ohm speaker. That doesn't mean it's four ohms across its entire range. That means that it could go up average. and down uh, with an average of four ohms. Actually, there's a rule sort of a law that says that if you say it's four ohms, it shouldn't go below 3.2 ohms. But a lot of people yeah. cheat that and they have speakers that 80%. go down to two ohms. So there are speakers that are called four ohms that if you actually look at the impedance or the resistance across frequency, think of it that way, could go from 30 to two. Yeah. And the point at which it's two when you have a two ohm output impedance of your amp and it's tackling a two ohm a portion of a speaker in let's say 150 hertz that's down to two ohms, now you've lost half the voltage, half power. Yeah. which is a quarter of the power, which is 60 B down, you, you're gonna hear that. So output impedance is important. It It is sometimes shown as damping factor on amplifier specs, you still see that. And when they say a damping factor, they, they're talking about the ratio of the output resistance versus an eight ohm ideal load. 
there's no way Oma Dia loads. I shouldn't say that. Uh, Kef made speakers many years ago that were called conjugate load matching. Conjugate load matching. You have to say that in, in English, in British English. Um, but here's a real imp impedance curve on a real speaker. This is, I, I, you know, I hid the name of it. But this is what happens with the speaker. So it, this may be typified as an 8-ohm speaker where, you know, this is 5 Somewhere around there is seven and a half or eight. So the average is around eight. Well, that could go down to five and it could go up as high um, as about 50. Really? 55. Yeah. Yeah, it's normal. So this is not unusual. So what is this? How is this up? How is this down? What the, what is What is this? Do we have time to explain this? We could do a whole other video on speaker and Peter. How can we not explain this now? After gonna, uh, just really quickly. The... Yeah. the the general electroacoustic drive that this thing is, as the thing moves and goes through the re acoustic resonances and electric resonances, there's different effects that are going on. Um, this could be the speaker. If you look at this, there's a frequency at which the port, this is a ported speaker. There's a frequency at which the port goes into resonance. When the port is in resonance, the efficiency is really high. So the impedance goes up, which means that the, the same amount of voltage is going to generate a lot more power so the resistance goes up think of it that way there's a port goes back down this is the resonance of the woofer resonance of the woofer is the place at which the resonance with just a little bit of energy the thing moves a lot impedance goes up or the ratio between voltage and current is very efficient resistance is all the way up here at 35. then it goes back down this is the point at which the system is the least efficient so right around, right around 180 ohms can, uh, can you see my little mouse key over here yeah, let me, yep. let me right, right around 180 ohms. This thing is uh, has a has an impedance of five ohms or resistance of five. Ohms. Then, it goes, then it goes up as the woofer goes inductive, and yeah. then it crosses it crosses over to the tweeter. And in the case of this, the, the particular design of the tweeter and its crossover had a really high uh, resistance over here. It goes back down, it goes back up. Whatever. This is not uncommon. That may be represented as an eight ohm speaker. It goes up and down. And so if an amplifier is driving this, at some frequencies, it's seeing a really easy load to drive. And at other frequencies, it's seeing a load that's sucking a little bit more electrons. Mm -hmm. And if the output resistance of the amp is high, like a tube amp, or a really poorly designed transistor amp, you'd have to do a really crappy job of that. Then what you're going to end up with um, is this kind of thing. So these are real measurements. This is, oh, Okay, this is another speaker, sorry. Uh, different measurement, yeah. different speaker. This is a speaker represented as a, I think a four or six ohm speaker. Starts here at 3.8, goes up to about nine, goes back down to 4.2, goes up to 15, goes up and back down. Um, and uh, I thought I had a measurement of the measured resistance at the terminals, I don't have that. But what's going to happen with a high output resistance is the the voltage at the speaker terminals is going to go up and down with this resistance. That's like putting an equalizer on your speaker that's going to put peaks and dips on it. You're going to hear this. As in, depending on the output impedance of your, of your amplifier, you're going to hear the effect. It's like turning tone controls up and down. Totally audible. Not uh not esoteric not something that somebody with a perfect ear is going to hear anybody would be able to switch uh, in switching between an amp and another is going to hear this so what you want given modern speakers that typically have impedances that drop down into the four or three ohm load you want an output impedance that's below 0.1 ohm uh and in damping factor gene you're going to calculate this for me while i'm getting into the next thing which is 0.1 divided by eight what damping factor is that Hold oh, on, I gotta get my, alert. I gotta get my, uh, nerd alert, alert, nerd alert, nerd alert. like an eight? You mean point one divided by eight? So can actually show up. What did you say it was point one divided by eight? Uh, point one divided uh, by by eight. Well, that's like a really small number. So, oh, you inverse. Oh, oh sorry, sorry, sorry. Eight divided by 80, point one. The reciprocal. So it's eighty. Yeah, yeah, it's eighty. So that's a damping. So, yep. So, so it doesn't take it doesn't take a big it doesn't take a big damping factor is what you're basically saying. I mean, you see some of these manufacturers that say their damp factor is 500, but that's at a very specific frequency under very specific test conditions. Yeah, it's probably linear with frequency over the range of a speaker. So anything better than 100 is fine. Yeah. And so 
manufacturers used to show that they don't show it anymore it's still important it's still important because you want to make sure that what you're picking up doesn't have a low damping factor when we talked about the damping factor of a tube amp into a two ohm load that would be one that would be two ohm into two two by two is one not good yeah. okay um all right that's bad behavior let's talk about another thing is signal polarity from input to output you guys probably never worry about this you probably never see it well there's amplifiers that are inverting, as in you put a positive signal on the input and what comes out the positive output is a negative signal. Who cares? Does anybody care? I mean, you can't hear absolute phase, so as long as it's doing it through the whole system, it's okay. Yes, you can. Absolute phase? Well, you can hear absolute phase. I, I, I mean, really? I'm thrilled to, to realize that you don't need a big dampening factor to please the speaker. I never knew that. Yeah, yeah, anything between 80 and 100 of a damping factor, not dampening, actually. Dampening is the act of putting water on something. Uh, but anything um, anything better than 80 is fine. Let's get to the signal polarity thing. Here's two places where you want to worry about this. Assuming you're doing a multi-channel system where you got left and right speakers, a center, some sides, some backs, some mm -hmm. tops, and some subwoofers, and you're mixing and matching amps. They're not all the same amps. If one of the amps in there is a polarity inverting amp, which is not uncommon, suddenly a whole bunch of your speakers are going this way when the other ones are going this way. Do you think you're going to hear that? Well, yeah, I meant if all your amps are doing it, you're not going to hear the difference. So if you have a 10 channel, uh, 10 channel, 10 channel amp that are all inverting, doesn't matter. But if you have okay. mix and match, I've never seen an amp do that yeah. before. So that's, that's I, interesting. I know of two amps that will go unnamed that are commonly sold in the CD channel that are inverting. You have to tell me one of them. Yeah, from well-known companies that should please. know better. That yeah, start, should, with, they, start with the letter C and end with N. Start with the letter. <laughs> He's not going to say it on the camera. <laughs> he is definitely I mean, a lobster. <laughs> that is interesting because I my, con my connection just fritzed out. <laughs> <laughs> wow. No, there are there there are amplifiers that are inverting, and, and so if go, that oh, happens, no, no, Anthony. Um, so if that happens and somebody runs their room correction system, their room correction system should pick up that one of the speakers are out of phase. May or may not, depending on things. Um, yeah. But certainly, here's an interesting thing. You said you can't hear phase uh, polarity inversion on a speaker. You can. Not if they're all inverted. You can. Check really? this out. I'm, okay, I'm, tell me how. Hey, let, it, let it be known. On this day, I'm going to teach Gene de la Sala something new that he didn't know. Check it out. Do you know that... <laughs> all hail. Do you know that the, the human ear hearing system of a human being only reacts on outgoing pressure, firing synaptic energy to the, to the brain? You know, when we're listening to sound, it's just pressure goes in, pressure goes out, pressure goes in. The mm -hmm. eardrum senses that, actuates these little bones that actuate pressure mm -hmm. in and out of these, the fluid in our cochlea. And then little hairs go bing, 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 bing. You know that there's about 30 different groups of hair that are about 30 different critical bands. Mm -hmm. And they only fire on the way out. Isn't that weird? So our hearing system is a half wave rectifier. It only reacts to the negative waves, a little bit to the positive, but the majority of it is negative. It's kind of like a diode that's got, you know, 0.7 volt uh, threshold bias or germanium ones, if you remember those, or 0.2 or 0.3. So if you listen to a saxophone, which is which is a s instrument with a very asymmetrical waveform, if you actually put that on a oscilloscope, you'll notice that the top side and the neg and the other side are different because of the way the reed moves on there. And you flip the polarity on a speaker, single mono speaker on its own. You flip the polarity, you're gonna go. That sounds a little different. The timbre, the character of it changes ever so slightly, but it does. And so, if you are truly an audioholic and you want perfect rendition of what was picked up. You want to make sure that the polarity is correct, which, of course, you never know if the microphones were polarized correctly or if the whole mixing console was done. But at some point, you need to respect polarity because there is a slight difference uh, between the two. If you don't believe me, there's papers written on this. Just look at it. At it like, can you hear absolute polarity? There was a seminal AES presentation, I'm going to say probably close to 30 years ago on this, uh, that proved that, yeah, you can hear it. So... It's very mild. You have to listen very carefully. 
So you don't have to get totally obsessive about it. It's not like, oh my God, my whole sound field is just going to have a whole veil unearthed in it. But those of us who are working in multi-channel systems or with speakers that have subwoofers, anything where there's mixes and matches of things, you got to make sure that the amps are all polarized correctly or else you got things driving out of phase with each other. Okay. So that's an important thing. You'll never see an amplifier manufacturer tell you whether the thing is inverting or not. They're just going to go, here's my amp. And so I got this from Wikipedia. It's basically saying what you said about a mono test. Gene, come on, dude. I, dude, my my uh, preamp is oscillating. Ironically, <laughs> I don't know why it's by the ocean. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> driving a difficult speaker. I don't know what this is a focus right. I've never had this problem. It's dead. You it's had one job, dude. One it's job. It's literally oscillating. Oh my god! I don't the know what's dampening going on. factor is not right. Let you me switch channels. Out. Hold on. The non-negative <laughs> feedback. Power transformers with dual inverted Darlington circuitry that's affecting the flux capacitor. That's the problem. See, Don, you're a geek. Don, Don you're good at this. All right, you're good. Can you hear this. me now? Dar Darlington amplifiers. Those are good. I used to make those when I was a kid. Okay, go ahead. You guys, hear me? Okay. Yep, we're good. So you found something on Wikipedia, which is the source of all truth in the world. But yes. Says, right. Here it says right here. There you go. I think that was about the same level I said, like under ideal conditions and with a mono speaker, maybe you can hear it. So what about when you have a stereo pair of speakers and you flip the phase on both speakers, you really think you're gonna be able to hear the difference there or is it harder to hear it there, right? Um, a, a demo I heard in a laboratory showed that, yep, you can sort of hear this. And as in on a blind AB comparison, right? Where you did an ABX, A in phase, B out of phase, and, and then you did an X where you tried to guess, you, you could probably get close to certainty on that. Wow. Okay. But more important, if you got a bunch of amps in a system, which, you know, I hope the people here uh, are not just stuck only on two channel. Once you've heard multi channel music probably Game produced theater. and played back, it is insanely good. And it doesn't have to be like stuff everywhere. It's just like, man, I'm really in this concert hall. Then you right. realize that all the speakers around you have to be polarized correctly and you have to pick amps that are all the same. So, hey, Anthony, have you had a chance to listen to the Atmos music stream through Apple yet? Yeah, it's it's a it's awesome. It's kick ass, and it? it's amazing. Kick ass. Yeah. I know. I'm so excited about this. Yeah. I'm excited. So I'll reveal why. Um, why why I'm even in this industry? Why am I even here? Um, years and years and years ago, uh, when I was a kid, you know, I started in this business as a kid with my dad. My dad, you know, listened to. It was an engineer played with audio. We had you know decent audio at home, and a friend's dad bought a. In the early in the seventies, bought a quadraphonic Quad, yeah. receiver. Yep. It may have been a Sansui, I forget. Quad and hooked up the speakers, and we all showed up. He had a bunch of program material, and I was like, "Oh yeah. my god, that's insanely fun!" The quad was and the shit, quad. Yeah. Uh, going back to the seventies, and uh, through my college days, I did some quad recording stuff, and then I interviewed at this company called Dolby. You know, it's, uh, right out of college, I was like, whatever, 21, 22. And they were looking to hire somebody that um, <clears throat> was going to help design microchips for noise reduction for cassette decks. Remember those, those things with those little reels, they're coming oh, yeah. back with here. Yep. And, um, but along the way, there's conversation of bringing this whole Dolby stereo experience into the home. And it was all about reinventing surround sound, you know, an enhanced version of quadraphonics. I was like, I'm really interested in this. This is really fun. And then I got very involved in that, which is why I'm here ch chatting about this stuff. What is this 35 years later or something? Um, so I, I, uh, when I was at Dolby, I spent a lot of time with, a, with both film and music guys and broadcast and trying to promote the idea of doing program material, uh, not just film, but other things in, in surround. I did a whole bunch of baseball and football games in surround sound way too early in, the, in 87, 88. Like, what were, what were we thinking? Um, but I, I'm really excited to see this finally start to be a real program. It's, it's so that's fun. Fine. Those of you guys who may be poo-pooing the whole concept because you're saying the only way music should play is out of two speakers, uh, you know, give yourself the, give yourself the option of listening to it. Once it's correctly produced, um, it's really fun. Now, not all of it is correctly produced. Some of it is just yeah. stuff everywhere for the sake of having more channels. Once they get better with the production of it, yeah. <clears throat> I, 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 I've heard really well recorded, multi-channel audio and and it blew me away and it's my it, i think it's the best audio you can have yeah. i'm still i love two channel much as anybody but when it's properly produced 
and present it on, on a correct system in a right room, it's magical. Yeah. And all it should do is the same thing you've heard in two channel, which is a soundstage in front of you, maybe a bit of whole hall ambience, but by coming out of more speakers, it's less speaker, it's less sitting to yeah, position dependent. You can spot. move around yep. and you can still hear things where they are. You can be there with a few buddies drinking bourbon and all enjoy a show. It's really cool. And it's all about I, I hope they eventually Love do you, man. Love you, man. Uh, I hope they eventually stream it in true HD because there are some of those Atmos mixes that have, you can tell they're Dolby Digital Plus. They're really mm -hmm. compressed mm -hmm. compared to the two channel lossless version. So, yeah. but at least we're doing, I've never thought we'd see the day where we're going to be streaming Atmos music. Right. Never thought, I, never. I, I got to tell you, Dolby Digital Plus, uh, believe me, is essentially transparent. As in you, you take program material, six channel, 24 bit, 96, and you run it through Dolby Digital Plus nothing's broken on the back end as long as you maintain a decent bandwidth as long as the coding is done correctly yeah the, the bandwidth yeah as long as the bandwidth is there which is which is nothing to do with dolby it's a it's to do with you know who's sending the data and, and you're getting it and how it has to get mashed so so as it gets there but i'm talking about some listening tests we did at lucasfilm years ago in the studio in which music or film was recorded listening to the masters the actual six track masters 24 right. 96 uncompressed 24 bit 96 kilohertz against a transcoded dolby digital plus and you sit there and you go this is the mixer that made the program material listening to all kinds of different yeah. things like can't hear a difference so it's it's damn good works really well yeah okay it's definitely so, better than dolby digital oh, we got a super chat here we want to address yep. real quick swirling dragon mist does the human ear favor mm -hmm. even or odd order harmonics from the physics of resonating cylinder open at one end and have an odd order resonance he looked that shit up online he didn't know that <laughs> um swirling dragon mist has asked i think these questions before um the tendency it's the answer is complicated and I, I fear that we're going to run out of time with this i'll just say to me it's not about e even versus odd T typically even is a little less audible and sounds a little more natural what matters is how far up from the the main signal is the harmonic so a even or, or odd low low value harmonic so second or third um is not that audible because there's a lot of masking from the main signal but the same amount of distortion in the seventh or eighth, which would be even and odd, at the same value would be way audible because it's way far away and you can really hear that. Oh, so more really important than worrying about even versus odd is worrying about how Where high of an order it is. Yeah. Um, so thanks for asking that. Okay, awesome. other good behavior in amplifier is it, it should be low noise. And the noise should be either uh, disclosed in decibels below versus one watt, 2.8 volts, or in micro volts. And you want the amp to be as quiet as possible. And when you're looking, you know, imagine you get to a point where you're looking at spec sheets and they all reveal how low, low of noise they are under the same conditions. You should choose the one with the lower noise. Why? Because if you, I'm a, I'm, I'm a big fan of high sensitivity speakers because I like things that aren't going through power compression when you crank it up because I like to listen too loud. Yep. So take a speaker that's 95 dB, 100 dB sensitive, which there are some out there. But they cost more. The drivers cost more. But, man, it just works better. If you put an amp that's noisy, you're just going to hear. Yep. And if you have two channels, you may not hear it. But by the time you do the kind of stuff I do, which is six, seven, eight, nine channels, you're going to hear noise. And the noise is going to get in the way of, of a sense of dynamics. So look for really low noise and the good behavior of an amplifier. So one thing I'd like to add to this discussion, if you're when you're talking about doing the spec and Gene, you're Michael killing Jonas. me on the mic. Dude, it's, I don't know what it is. It's never try, done this before. Try, try, try jostling your, your connector. I changed yeah, cables. You should use some better cables on that. No. This is literally this the it's preamp it. is oscillating and I don't know why. And this is a $500. Oh, I don't get it. Anyway, oh he's oh. trying he's trying the tapper test on it to see if that That's works. It. So engineering back to the uh, Don, shut the fuck up. Oh <laughs> thank you. Oh I, I lose I, I lose my train of thought, love. man. His eighty. I want, I'm, gonna, over the place. I'm gonna train your ass later. Talk to me like that. Oh, that sounds that sounds <laughs> A little gay but not that there's anything wrong with that but anyways when i see you all right shut yeah. up seriously and and so you guys deal, wonder why i like doing these it's just sitting here watching don and gene it's just entertaining i actually Go i ahead. can mute his mic so here there all right so <laughs> he can't say shit now um what i think is important when you're doing specs on signal to noise ratio is 
give us the one watts back because if one amplifier is 100 watts rated at 100 watts with the SNR versus one that's rated at 500 watts, the 500 watt amp is going to look like it has a better SNR when it may not because you don't you have to translate it down to equal power. Yeah, yeah, it's that's dynamic range. The difference between the maximum voltage and the noise is dynamic range. What's been known as signal to noise, which is the ratio between one one watt, which depends on the load, but 2.8 volts and the, and the noise expressed in decibels is the signal to noise ratio. Um, it does get confusing. And I, I think as long as it's either expressed in decibels relative to a number that we all agree to, right. or just in microvolts and you're looking for the number that's the lowest, you're good. People don't, consumers are not going to understand microvolts. They understand dBs, yeah. barely. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, so other good behavior issues are protection circuits. People don't think about this. So any decently designed amp is going to have um, some some devices, some some protection electronics that's looking at what the output devices are doing and making sure it's protecting them from overloading. Um, I guess it would be sort of like a car that's not letting you go to go past red zone where you can push the accelerator all you want. It's going to go and then stop right before red zone so you don't blow up the, the, the engine. So there are a lot of different ways to design protection circuits. Uh, and there's a lot of philo philosophies about that. Some manufacturers just go, well, we're going to look at the maximum current and we're going to let, not let it go any past that point. So there's the crowbar that goes, you know, we won't let you go there. Some amplifiers just turn off. They're just going to protection. There's a light that goes from green to red. It goes, man, you just tried to drive too much current and too much power out of me. I'm overheating. I'm just turned off. Some of them turn off for three seconds, then come back up. Some of them turn off until you actually go to the amp, hit the power button, and then they come back up. What do you like? Just be aware that there's different types of protection circuits. So I'm, I kind of like amps in which... There is kind of a limiting circuit, something that says, okay, we've just gotten past the safe operating area of these output devices, and we're going to flash some red lights at you telling you that you're pushing this a little too hard, but they're going to limit it. There's just going to go, we're going to let the signal go through, or we're going to put a speed governor on this and just go, yeah, you may want to keep turning the dial up to 12, 13, 14, you know, the, the amp that goes up to 11, you can go to 12, um, mm -hmm. and we won't let you go there. You keep turning up, it just won't play. That's like kind of my my approach, but there's something that's flashing red going, yeah, you're pushing me too hard. But not every amp designer thinks that way. There's some people who go, no, um, we're just going to shut down because we, we want to make sure we're not blowing the output devices on this. Once you blow the output devices, that whole amp has to be put back in its box, shipped back to the manufacturer, repaired for some unknown number of, of dollars and bent back. So there's different approaches at that. You just got to look for how they do that. Is any so you want to hear you, you want to hear an interesting story about amp protection circuit? Yeah. Um, years ago, I had an amplifier, very high in amp. I'm not going to say the name. I'm going to do the thing that you do. Um, <laughs> I could always tell when there was a problem with a loudspeaker design because it would shut the amp off. The amp wasn't clipping, but I knew if the impedance of the speaker dropped below about three ohms, it would trip the circuits on the um, on the amplifier, right? So I wrote the manufacturer, I said, look, I have XYZ speakers, your amp continually shuts off with these conditions. And I saw the impedance when it dipped below three ohms, it would shut the amp off. The next generation product, they lowered the uh, sensitivity on that and they yep. sent me that amplifier and never shut off. But that was a good, that was a good litmus test to see if a speaker yep. was designed messed up, you know, L if they had a problem with the crossover. LX7 maybe? No, you, no, it wasn't that. Different. It was th something much newer. Much newer. Um, so that's not a defective amp. That's just the designer being very conservative. Yeah, very, very conservative. So the Japanese products, and this is not a racist thing, Japanese products tend to be more conservative with their protection circuits than Amer yeah. Americans. Americans go balls to the wall. Japanese make sure their shit never blows up. Yeah. Well, yeah. that, that Yamaha part, part of the, amp. Part of the yeah. repetition. So there is an amplifier. Uh, I brought it up, the LX7, and there's a reason why I say that. Very good amp. Uh, uh, design crown design, very, very, very great sounding app, fantastic. The design was made for commercial applications, and the, the edict was it will not blow up, and so it would do exactly the same thing three ohms, which is considered like, dude, if you're trying to drive three ohms, something's right. Actually, it was at about two and a half ohms, it would just shut, shut down. And it was a very uh, American design, so I'm contradicting you, American design, um, and it was conservative. And that, a, that was a multi channel. 
multi-channel amplifier. It was right? a multi-channel amplifier, yeah. And, and there were some speakers from a different company that will go unnamed. Uh, that uh, that were low right? impedance. Um, so if you ever, if any of the audiences over here is listening and has a, a, a Lexicon brand LX7 from many years ago, and you're wondering why mm -hmm. it shuts down, it's not the amp. It's perfectly well designed. It's just really conservative. You're, you're driving a speaker with an impedance that goes probably too low for good behavior. All right. right. Next thing. Now I'm getting really geeky. Input CMRR for balanced lines. As uh, CMRR is common mode rejection ratio. If you have a, an amp with an XLR input or uh, or a Phoenix, you know, barrier strip connector with plus minus and ground, um, some of those things on the consumer side are really poorly designed. The, the intended design of those balance lines is you're feeding a signal that's out of polarity on purpose. That's what's going down the XLR connector or balance line. Same thing, by the way, that goes through a Cat5 cable is same, same but equal, equal yep. but opposite. And any signal that lands on that wire along the way from the source to the receive, which would be interference, gets canceled out because the input circuit is a subtractor. It's actually rejecting anything that's common. So because the intended signals are, are out of polarity on purpose, it's amplifying the difference, which is your signal you want to hear. And anything that landed on the wire uh, is now common. It gets rejected. And some designs are good and some designs are not so good. A good a good common mode rejection ratio for something very well designed would be 60 decibels. Mm -hmm. That's pretty um, much standard. And, and that's a, either a good active circuit or really good transformer. Um, and a bad one could be 10 or five. I've seen some really crappy designs that have an XLR input that have no common mode rejection to speak of. Um, what do you think so, about, what do you think about most of consumer audio is not truly differential input and output. It's usually just a phase splitter. What do you think about the products that actually do differential circuits from in to input to output versus the cheaper way of doing it where they just use phase splitters on the outputs and say, bam, we got balanced. So the idea of balanced is you got it. You got a, you got a circuit, the input and the output are symmetrical. They're, they're, they're polarity flipped and the circuit inside is, is actually single-ended and that's the way to do it so there are amplifier manufacturers that goes it's truly balanced as in the input through the output is two separate circuits yeah and the issue i have with that is if there is noise along the way really loud noise along the way the amplifier is amplifying that because you're passing it through all the way to the speaker and the yeah speaker but they're out of phase i mean anything in telecom that we designed in telecom back in the day when we we're doing voice over pots all the circuits had to be fully differential so right. we could not we could not get the SNR down good enough and the distortion got down good enough if you just ran single ended circuits. So, so at, at some point though, you got to cancel out that unintended common signal, the common mode that you have to reject. And so, it, uh, where is it? So if you if you take a preamp that's uh, that's feeding a balanced signal, and you go into a power amp that's balanced all the way through, as in the positive out input goes mm -hmm. directly to a power amp that's driving the positive output. And the negative goes through, and there's there's nothing inside. Then your speaker ends up being the common mode rejection device because it's it's taking two signals that are out of phase, and that's okay. But along the way, your 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 uh, the noise that's injected is amplified along with a signal, and your amp is working over time for no good reason. That's I'm not a let's just say I'm not a really big fan of that. I'm I'm fan I'm a fan of sort of more traditional audio topologies where the input stage is either a real transformer i still love those things uh, or an a, or you know a transformer less active circuit that's or differential input amplifier. differential input that's rejecting all the crap that got picked up in the wire on the way in C cancel that out then do what you got to do and then drive the speakers um and for every me saying that there's another one goes no it's better to do the other way bottom yeah. line somewhere that needs to be common mode rejection which <laughs> is rejection of the common signal that needs to be good um, and a lot of manufacturers, but very few people uh, in the consumer side uh, spec that professional products always saw, always show what what the CMRR is, whether it's 45, 50, 55, 60. I'd say anything over 40 or 45 is probably fine for a high-end product. It should be 60. Yeah. Okay. Other elements of good behavior. Um, so by the way, the, wh what do these things have to do with absolute sound quality? Well, everything or nothing. You could say that the polarity being flipped doesn't change the sound quality. Well, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But in the context of a system, it will screw up your enjoyment. The low, the noise, if an amplifier is sort of noisy, does that affect the quality of a piano? Well, you could go, well, you know, the piano sounds great. Yeah, but if there's hiss, you're not really hearing 
everything you should hear in the dynamics of it. Protection circuits, you go, well, how does that affect my enjoyment of, of the music? Well, if the thing shuts down in the middle of a triple forte in a symphony and you have to get up and go flip the power, what's just happened to your musical enjoyment, right? That's just behavior. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, next thing, people don't think about this, mechanical noise. So there are amplifiers out there that have fans in them, uh, small fans to keep things qu quiet. Well, that thing better, if it's in the rack right by your side and it's putting 40 dB of noise into the room, Where's where's the subtlety in your music? It's covered up by from the fan. Yeah. So you need to make sure that whatever product you're picking, if it actually does have fans in it, that they're quiet. And there's a lot of products that come out of the commercial space that are very, very good sounding products, but they have fans because they're designed to work in 100 degree weather. Can't put those in a rack right by your head. So um, Don, question for Don, how often when you do theater installs, how often is the equipment in the same room where the speakers are? I mean, these days, not so much. I try to always do a sub rack in theaters when I can, just because of the local source, um, you know, Blu-ray players and whatnot. I don't want to make my clients walk down a hallway and up a set of stairs, but I, I would say more often than not, there's, there's equipment in the room or near the room, but right. not as much as it used to be. Yeah. I mean, a, a proper, you know, Cedia style integrated design, the rack is somewhere else. You don't have all sure. the flashing lights. You don't have all that, but it, you're not, it's not always that way. You don't always have the space. Sometimes you have the rack in the cabinet at the front or the side. And if you got a bunch of things that make noise in there, whether it's network switches that are the worst, well, man. Which we found out with Gene's system, you know, your personal yeah. system where we had to make a couple changes on that. Yeah. So, so, so look for that. I'm just, what I'm doing is raising a bunch of things that as you're going through the specs, you should be looking at. So how noisy is the, are the fans or transformer hum and vibration? So transformer hum is a real toroidal. issue. A big yeah, time. Big yeah. toroidals. Yeah. Yeah. Big time. Um, so, so sometimes they hum, sometimes they don't. And sometimes they don't hum when you get them. And then a year later they hum. <clears throat> yeah. But uh, uh, what, well, the great that? thing about this is there's so many factors involved in it other than just the basic ratings that yep. people are given. And there's tons yep. of different factors. Yep. So this is a this is a mechanical noise spec that doesn't make the doesn't mean the amp is bad. If the amp is in a different room or is not, you know, right within earshot, you're fine. But if you know that the amp's gonna be in an equipment rack or some shelves right by there, you're gonna want to make sure you you have an amp that doesn't put out noise, mechanical or audible noise. Okay, that's all in the behavior. And then there's this new thing we need to worry mm -hmm. about, which is latency. So uh, latency is what happens when we get onto these phone calls, which is we talk and talk and talk, and we get to the topic way late, right? Here we are an hour into this thing, <laughs> and we're, we're getting close to the end of my presentation. So what is this? Um, this is going to become more and more and more of an issue. Uh, amplifiers are going from old style analog class A amplifiers, which is grossly inefficient. They have good sound, but they're very inefficient. And they mean that you have to have a whole separate 50 amp breaker just to drive your amps to uh, digital switching amps with built-in digital signal processing. So you can actually do correction of whatever is going on electroacoustically in your room. I'm a big fan of that. Um, if you guys have been listening to me for a while, you've heard that I believe that the best speaker in the world, doesn't matter how expensive, how perfect it is, you put it in the room, the room's screwing it up. That's just how it is, because the room is doing this to the speaker, okay? There's walls around it, it's gonna screw it up. And there's a few ways to correct that, including some acoustical treatments, proper placement of the speaker in the room, and then some electronic corrections, and that's called digital signal processing. Challenge with DSP is it takes a while for the computation to happen. And some amplifiers actually have a delay. The signal goes in, 10 milliseconds later, it goes out after it's done all that stuff. So how much is acceptable? Well, it really depends if you're, if all of your amplifiers are on that delay, then it's not that big of a deal unless you see lip sync issues, which don't happen in 10 milliseconds. But if you have some amplifiers that are digital or, or have DSP delay and some that don't, then you have to recalibrate your distances on your speakers to compensate. That's a tricky, that's tricky to do. Really that's actually tricky. really tricky. The, the way I do it, and we could talk, we could do a separate video on it, but I, I look at each speaker individually and I make sure I get good blend with the crossover of the subwoofer at the crossover region, then I know if they're reasonably in delay, proper uh, alignment, because you can't always know how many milliseconds the delay the amplifier has. Almost no manufacturer will tell you that, especially if it's an outboard DSP box. Didn't you have to do that with your subs in your family room, Gene? Yeah, the JL Audio subs yeah. had a, a pretty good amount of delay on those the subs. Late, I wasn't yeah, expecting that. You had to yep. change the distance on them. Yep. Yeah. Yep. 
Now the subs are late. You have to handicap everybody else. And yes. at that point you could end up with lip sync. So yeah. thank goodness for a long time, TVs took a long time to produce their picture and they had 60 milliseconds of delay. So you'd have to delay the audio. So th things didn't sound like, hello, <laughs> you know, yeah. but I've actually run into combinations of surround decoders and amps in which the, the global latency of the system was a hundred milliseconds. Yeah, that can so be all. How long is a hundred milliseconds? Right. That's that's that you can hear that. Thirty milliseconds yeah. is where you start to hear an echo, where you hear you hear ta da, um, and a hundred milliseconds is ta da. I mean, it's. Uh, so I was trying to make that longer, but that's way too long for music. Mm -hmm. If if you're just listening to two channel stereo and both both channels have the same latency, not a problem. No issue. Yeah. When you're listening to multi channel audio and the amps have all different latencies. It may become an issue if you can't adjust the delays to compensate. And when you you tie a picture to that, you got to make sure that everything starts to work. So you got to look at this. It may or may, may not be a problem, but I'm I'm going to predict that this is becoming a bigger and bigger issue over time as everything as the world is going to bits. Like my friend John Kellogg from at the time Dolby used to say, everything is digital. Um, hi, John, if you're watching. So. Um, Nobody tells you this in the pro audio side. I'm, I keep saying this: the commercial and pro audio, they they do tell you on the consumer side they don't. Well, guess what? This new thing we're we're working on with me and my buddies at CDA and other associations, you will see this listed, um, which doesn't mean it's a bad amp. It just may not work for your application. All so, right. do you trust real quick? Do you trust room correction when it? Let's say you have a DSP in your system, and your speakers are normally fifteen feet away, but the room correction says they're now thirty feet away because of that DSP, which means it adds about fifteen milliseconds of delay. Do you trust the room correction system to get that right? That's a great um, question. No, <laughs> no because, <laughs> not because of the absolute. Because I've seen it screw up so 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 often. Um, we. We should do a session on room correction and what are what we're finding or not finding with it. The fact yeah. is that measuring a really accurate impulse response across the broad range of frequencies in an echoic room, which is the rooms we're in, gets complicated. As in, you know, if you're relying on being able to see the beginning, the actual accurate onset of an oncoming wave, and if everything is perfect, it's all good. But by the time you have rooms that may have echoic characteristics or near reflections, um, the robot can get confused. And you end up with with some problems. So uh, no, no, I don't. I always look at what it says. I've seen things like move the the crossover filters to 200 hertz, move it down to 30 hertz. All, all kinds of things that don't make sense. So yeah. not not a fan. If you're really gotcha. serious about what you're doing and you're you're willing to stay up late listening to us three go on about this BS uh, that we think is important, uh, yeah. then you probably need to start to learn how to correct the stuff manually, which is not that hard to do. So other element of good behavior is radiated fields. I call that you're not alone. So some products um, have uh, either high frequency or hum radiation or things out the top or the bottom or the back because there's electronics that are spraying radiated fields. And um, if you're building things, if you're building product in the commercial space, guaranteed are, I'm guaranteed you're going to get transfer that right away. You're not going to get away with that. But when you're building in the consumer space where people just put a thing on a shelf and they don't care about what what radiation is going up or down or side, you may get away with it. And then suddenly you're you've got a system in which you're stacking components and one of them is receiving a lot of hum from the other. Yikes. So that's kind of back to the business of transformers or other high frequency issues that are spraying out the top or bottom and it's not properly shielded. So those things also need need to be specified and, and looked at um, really important on, on amplifiers and electronics. So um, that's that business of, of good behavior. I'm just gonna go through some functional things, which is other, other items when you're looking at specs of amps you may or may not consider. So there's amps, they, you can take them out of the box, you put them on the shelf, there's not adjustable gain. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that okay? Maybe that's okay. If you're doing two channel stereo and you just have source devices, a streaming device, a CD player or something else, you know, a, a turntable, a reel to reel machine, and they're going into your preamp and the output's just going into an amp after your volume control, you're fine. If you're doing a multi-channel system with different speakers and different amps, you may want to have adjustable gain on the amp so that you get everything within the same gain structure. You don't need a full range like from, from all the way off to like plus 35, but a, about 20 dB of adjustment range I think is nice 
so that you can pre-integrate the, the gain so that the speakers all work well together. I mean, you have channel trim adjustments that should cover that range if you don't have you, the ability to do it at the amp side. You, you do. Watch out, though. Some of those are real level gain control. Some of them are digital steppers, you know, where you actually are digital digitally adjusting the gain plus and minus 20 dB. And that means you could be gathering noise, not not hash, but noise within within the product because you're actually turning the, the digital word down 20 dB. Uh, not a fan. I'd rather adjust everything, you know, and typically in the analog domain and the amp to get them to get the amp and speaker given the same signal coming out of the decoder producing about the same. Right, amp. right. And doesn't mean it's a good or bad amp. It's just a functional thing that you may want to go, you know, and what I'm doing. Yeah, I've got different speakers with different sensitivities. I got a room in which the front speakers are really far and the, and the side speakers are really close. I may want to turn those down. Kind of nice to have trims somewhere on the amplifier. So Sometimes maybe a good maybe a good recommendation is to stick with the same amplifier company in your setup because they generally, I notice uh, the companies generally have the same gain structures in all their products most of the time. Um, I, yes, I've seen also some that one amp is 28 dB, the other one's 35. Um, some of them have dip switches for that. Some of them, they're knobs. I like the dip switches better because nobody can come back and. Yeah, and they can't mess with them. it. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Other things in functional specs, uh, what kind of inputs do you have? Are they just single ended or balanced? If they're balanced, are they XLR? Are they barrier strip? Are they Phoenix? Again, that doesn't mean the amp's good or a bad amp, but things you should be considering when you're thinking about what to buy. Um, so here's an interesting little thing, ground lift. Uh, it's been a long time since I've seen an amp with a little switch that g gives you a ground lift. So you buy an amp, you stick it on a wood shelf, you connect it in and out. Nothing's the chassis is not connected to anything else. Who cares? So you take that same app a few years later and you put it a in a rack where you screw it in with well, a bunch of other gear and it's sharing, uh, chassis grounds suddenly you end up with these hum problems and you're chasing them down and chasing them down and you're putting the the, the power connector, the mains like they mm -hmm. see in England on a cheater, which you shouldn't do. And, and it's like, ah, sometimes it's nice to actually have a switch that lifts the chassis ground from the audio ground. So I think that's a, a really important topic that you just covered right now when you said that you could lift the chassis ground, but not the earth ground at the power side, because that could be potentially dangerous, right? If you take a three prong um, power, amplifier and then try to convert it to two to two prong it's a potential shock hazard if somebody touches the uh, metal of the amplifier yeah if something goes wrong so the the ground lift controls actually leave the 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 ground prong to the chassis of the amp but the audio ground is lifted it's just it's floating on what it, whatever is coming in and that's kind of a cool thing to do there's other topologies on that but um you know, you could choose or not whether, you know, if, if if you're looking at two amps and everything else is identical and one has a ground lift uh, switch for $2 more, go for the ground lift because that, that yeah. may save you from hum hassles down the line. Okay, other functional specs. What kind of class of amplification are you looking at? So um, is it an A, A, B, B, D, H, or other topologies? Does that matter, Gene? I mean, yeah, you don't want you don't want class A in home theater. Why not? See, too much heat, too much power loss. What if you have a lot of air conditioning? What What if you live in Alaska and it's cold all the time? <laughs> I mean, I guess that could be a benefit. It could be like a heater, space heater for yeah, you. I just, I don't thing? see, I don't see much benefit anymore in power mm -hmm. amplifiers that are pure class A. I think it's right. kind of antiquated, and it's time to move on. Right. So twenty years ago, we made not have been able to say this but today digital switching amps ones in which the the power the voltage rail is going up and down to follow the signal so that you don't have a huge amount of dissipation on the output devices also also known as switching supply class d amps some of them sound amazing they sound every bit as good as a class a amp and there's people who are like this guy's full of bs it's like i've done the listening tests i'm not biased no. Put it, put it all behind, you know, on an ABX test where you don't know what you're listening and go, can I tell the difference between this and that? And given normal speaker loads, because there's also that thing of like bizarre speaker loads, they sound great. So why would you want to suck a bunch of power out of the wall and give all your, mo your money to, to Con Ed or PG&E or whoever it is um, when you don't need to? So if you love the idea of class or cl class A or class AB amps and you're willing to tolerate the heat, go for it. But that's just, that's a functional spec that today doesn't, 
tell you very much about what you're going to get in sound quality. And, and to add to that point, if you don't want to do class D for whatever reason, class H or class G, uh, where yep. you have, it's basically a class AB amp at low power, then the, uh, it goes to a different rail for the higher power transients. Yeah. That's a very efficient way of doing things. Yeah. I know some of the older amplifiers I had from Emotiva, those things yeah. never ran hot and they would put out over a kilowatt of power. Yeah. And they sounded great. So you don't have to go class D if you have this predisposition against class D. But right. you should consider when you're doing high power to go to a type of rail switching. To a rail switching amp. And in a yeah. way, a rail switching amp is is like a two-stage class D amp, right? Rather right. than infinitely adjustable, it's two stages. And NAD and other people made great sounding amps years ago for not that much money that did that. They just had two rails and it would switch up and down. The high voltage rail couldn't hold current for very long and you didn't need it because it was for peaks. Great design. And you could get 500 watts out of a thing that wasn't that big, didn't pull a bunch of power out of the wall and create a bunch of heat. So speaking yeah. of heat, another functional spec, I'm looking at the clock. As usual, we're over time. It's okay, right? Um, when you, when in your, again, I'm sorry. This this whole session, these all three sessions, is all about helping you when you're trying to pick an amplifier for your system. What are things you should look at? Well, you may not have thought of looking at the heat character of an amp. You may never have looked at that. How many BTUs, British thermal units, does it put out? Um, mm -hmm. And how, how much does it heat up a room? You may have gone, I don't really care. Well, maybe you should. Here's where it gets interesting. Let's say you have two big class A amps for your surrounds and tube amps for your fronts. And now you're putting out about 10,000 watts of heat in the room. Now you need an air conditioner. So now you've, you've said, oh, no problem. We'll put a mini split over here. So you put this thing over here that's sitting on the side to cool down the room and putting in 45 dB of noise. You're not an yeah. audiophile anymore. Yeah, you're not listening to high quality sound. You're listening to noise. Sorry, that's an, that's an issue we have to address um, on a regular basis for sure. Yeah, yeah you, the room needs to be quiet. How quiet? Well, in in well, acoustic science, about better. what's called NC15, which is noise yeah. criteria 15, which believe it or not is 15 dB above the threshold of hearing. If you don't have a big expensive microphone, it's hard you can to do measure this. that. Yeah, you can do this. Check it out. Everybody has these. Uh, I. Most people have these. Some people have lost one along the way. Uh, then they can go like this. No, you do this. Plug your ears for about five or 10 seconds. You're in the room, the room you've chosen to use as your audio file room. And you plug your ears and you, you're quiet, which I can't ever do, for about 10 seconds. And then you unplug your ears and you listen. If you hear any difference between plugged and unplugged, the room has too much noise. Oh, that's a good test. Hmm. Um, now, the ear stuck into the ear is also creating vibration from your hand. So put in some some earplugs, you know, some good foam earplugs. Stick them in there for 15 seconds a minute and then carefully pull them out. If you hear anything, too noisy. And I guarantee you're going to start to hear things that you didn't know were there. So uh, the room's going to be quiet and heat can, can end up leading you to having to open windows, have fans, have air conditioners, all of which produce uh produce noise. All right, next thing in the functional specs is heat flow direction. So let's say you have an amp um, that has a quiet fan in it, which some people do, you know, that's a thousand watt amp, but they've got a really big quiet fan. Make sure you know which way the heat is going. Is it pulling air from the front and pushing it out the back, which means you can't push that, that amp all the way up to the back of a shelf, or is it the other way around? Um, does anybody tell you that? Don? No. Do you, you ever see that spec in an amp when you put them in a rack? No. Commercial no. amps sometimes will tell yeah, you. Commercial, commercial amps will sometimes, but it's just never something that we have to deal with in an amplifier or something we look right. for. Right. So, again, in this this list of specs, you know, in the footnotes, there'll be something of that that goes, you know, the, the heat's going from here to here, here to there, bottom to top, wherever, just so to make your, your life easier. Other things that are worth looking at is environmental issues. Uh, how resistant to humidity is your product? Um, and you go, what? Well, I've done projects in this town called Singapore. Singapore has the, I'm going to say, uh, actually has the close to the highest concentration of millionaires per square mile of anywhere else in the world, if not the highest. And along with that is the highest concentration of audiophiles. There's a lot of people who love, love, love high-end audio. Mm -hmm. There's an entire building called the Adelphi building in Singapore that's nothing but audiophile stores, one after another, six really? or seven stories tall. Great place to go visit. Um, but it's really humid. 
Singapore, it's it's like you're in water all day long. And For some sure. products with humidity end up with corrosion on the circuits inside or the connectors um, and are sensitive to that. They were designed in a place that wasn't that humid. And then you go into humidity. And if you don't have proper air conditioning, the product today could sound fine. And five years down the line or three years down the line, everything's starting to fritz, kind of like your microphone, Gene. Maybe that's your problem. <laughs> um, it's vintage. So, uh, so something to look at. People don't usually tell you we're trying to spec that out. Uh, then I wrote dust dimensions. That's a mistake, but uh, dust resistance. So if you're in a place that's dusty, like let's say you're putting those amps in a rack and things tend to be dusty there, you want to make sure that you can control the dust going in and out of the fans. Um, dimensions and weight are worth knowing so that your your your, your okay. shelf doesn't get over overloaded. And supply voltage range. So what is that about? Um, I know I'm talking about stuff that people are like, what? Mm -hmm. So you're assuming you're plugging this thing into the wall and it's going to work. And some products are made to work on a voltage swing from 90 volts to 250 volts. Yeah. And some other cool. products at 105 volts, they start to misbehave. And what's 105 volts? Well, brownout That's conditions or close to yeah. brownout conditions get down there. And what happens when the amp is at 105 volts? Does it shut down? Does it blow up? Does it sound terrible? Uh, the voltage rails may go down, but does it start to clip terribly? Don't really know. Things that people don't think about, right? Um, I worked on a project in a really expensive house in Beverly Hills at the top of the hill in an, in an environment that had an electrical system that was built in the 20s. Hmm. And at, in the evening and summer nights, the voltage at the top of the hill was 100 volts. Did it have the yeah. ceramic with the wire ran around it going everywhere? <laughs> Some of the old houses about. probably had that. You know what I'm um, talking about, yeah. What was going on? Well, the transformer at the bottom of the hill was probably 1920s vintage, and the wiring go up the hill was all old and not big enough, and it started to, you know, with the impedance of the wire, it started to drop voltage as people started to pull 50 amps, 60 amps off the, off their, their uh, panel. And so all the way at the top of the hill, if you wanted to listen to, to audio at 8 o'clock at night on a decent amplifier, you couldn't because you had 100 volts trying to feed 120 volt uh, supply. Hmm. And some of the products misbehaved. So look at that, like what's this, what's the stated supply voltage range on this amplifier? Go for the thing that's the widest possible. These are all things you never thought about, right? And they all affect the enjoyment yeah. of your music. All right, I'm getting close to the end. Um, so what are the power requirements? So like, so here's this thing, you're gonna put it on a shelf, put it in a rack, and you're gonna plug it into your outlet somewhere and can you actually get enough power out of your either your rack if it's got a big strip a big strip of power connectors or out of the wall and um not a lot of manufacturers tell you what is the maximum power un under max condition eighth eighth power which is considered the the highest the lowest efficiency the highest heat conditions and at idle and you're going to start seeing that from you certainly do see that on commercial amps and you'll see that more often on residential amps if we so have that eighth power is actually that applies mostly to class a b amps yep. and that's so if you look at a lot of the receivers when they say that the receiver consumes 500 watts yeah. they're only driving um the channels at one eighth power all the channels so yeah so it's not a max power so i, I did a whole video about this so a yamaha receiver that says 500 watts power unless it says max could actually put out close to 1100 watts if it's like a nine or 11 channel receiver when you're really driving a thing at higher power levels. Right. So that is important to know for sure. Right. right. Okay. Uh, what else we got here? Is the thing rack mountable? Uh, what is the on off switching like? So some amplifiers out there, the only thing that turns them on and off is a giant rocker switch on the front or a big button. And some of them actually have some way to remote control them. Um, if you don't care, if you're like, no, the way I listen is I go to the amp, I turn it on and I sit down, I listen, it's fine. Or if you're hiring Don to do an integrated system Finish. where you want to hit the button that goes, play me music. Well, you want the amp to turn on and you need to make sure it's a thing that has some kind of remote control. Um, or Don remote. has to put in a giant automation relay. He's going to charge you more money for putting a big switch switched control on the outside. Um, so what's your, what's your thoughts on leaving an amp on all the time versus turning yeah. off on and off. That was always a big thing back in the day. Yeah. Um, I, in my entire history of working on products with electronics, amplifiers, I've only ever seen one blow up when it was just sitting there turned on. Right, right. 
about a week ago, I saw another amp blow up during power up. Like he had power. Oh yeah. <laughs> the caps so went usually, bad. You, usually in the power off power on cycle is when things well, blow up. In, and in, go, the, in, the, in the audio wives tales that we used to have in the past are like, Oh, you got to leave your amp on all the time. It keeps it warm and it makes it last longer. Well, and the reason, part of the reason for that is people don't know how to design an inrush current limiter circuit. So if you actually design the amplifier correctly for power up and it doesn't cause a massive inrush, you shouldn't have any problems with your yeah. amplifier. And the amplifiers that took that long to warm up to reach their idle bias, that you don't, that's not a problem today. I mean, there's, that's right. esoteric yeah. designs. Again, we're dealing with 1970s, 80s kind of technology. You just yeah. uh, turn a class D amp on now, it sounds exactly the same way as you turn it on now, right. as opposed to letting it idle for an hour before right. you use it. So the long and short of that is the heat cycle, just like in a car, is what damages the, the devices probably the most. And if you design it correctly, it's not an issue. So right. knowing nothing else, I just rather leave them on all the time uh, because it doesn't, um, short from what happens with the electrolytic capacitors from being on all the time, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't reduce the useful life of the thing. But I've, I've seen plenty of amps fry on a power cycle. Yeah, most of them we have now have triggers on them anyways yeah. in some capacity. All right, to si summarize all this, there's a bunch of specs that are useful, power, sound quality, behavior. Uh, is this the product you need based on all of the above? Um, and you're not going to see a bunch of the specs I covered in the last three sessions. You're not going to see. Ask the manufacturer. Pick up the phone. Ask to talk to marketing first. Ask to talk to engineering. Go, you know, I'd love to know uh, what the blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, what's your phase, phase margin? Is it reasonable? What's your output impedance? And they're going to go, why are you asking this? It's like, I'm just trying to pick an amp that's got a good behavior. And they they will know, and they'll gladly tell you. Um, so um, that's all I got to say about this small topic. Just tell them your own part. Anthony asked you. Asked yeah, you Annie. Ask I'm calling because Anthony said, you know. Annie, uh, Uncle Anthony. Uncle Anthony. So what did we learn from all this? What amp should we get now? Because people are mm -hmm. going to ask me. So you had a three-part series. What amp should I buy? Should I get that crown? Should I get the Krell? What should they get, Anthony? Um, so what they should get first, actually, this is an interesting thing. First thing you should look at is if the spec seems nice and long with a whole bunch of data, you should go into that mode of going, okay, whatever these guys are doing, they're transparent. So your trust level should go forward one, one giant step. Number one, number two, um, you know, look at this again. Look at this session. I'm sorry to say, you know, another. Maybe you can fast forward through the banter where we we give each other crap. Um, but look, look at this and and like, oh, what's important to me? Do I care about the automation? Do, does it is it, is it an issue to me? Do I care about the behavior under clip conditions? Uh, you know, I talked last time about you know how does it recover from clip? Well, I'm never going to turn it up to where it's going to clip because I don't listen loud. So you don't worry about that. So. You know, look through all of these things I've covered and go, what matters to me? And then just go pick your amps based on those specs. And I, I guarantee right now, a lot of them, you won't find data on what I said. But in the next six months or a year, you're going to start to see it. Or pick up the phone, call call the manufacturer and go, you know, I'm looking for the specs on this. And they go, well, why are you asking? This is really great. Well, you know, like, look at the Audioholics uh, webinars, you know, teach them something. Um, and or tell them, you know, I'm, I just want to know I'm getting the right thing, and and these are things I care about. Hmm. All right. Well, there you have it. All right, guys. So I think we are wrapped on this topic. I think we uh, need to move on from amplifiers next week, and we should start talking about some calibration stuff. Yeah. That would be really useful. So I'll be thinking about that, and um, we'll figure out what that topic is, and we'll announce it beforehand, give you guys plenty of time to, to let you know. Don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audiohawks. You get direct access to us to ask questions, suggest topics. I'm going to put the PowerPoint up there. So if you want to follow along with what we talked about today, you could do it at your own leisure. Guys, thanks for being here so late at night. I know it's late, for especially for me and Don being on the East Coast. Anthony, yeah. uh, I don't even know where you are. You're always in another country. Where yeah. are you? I'm I'm in California right now. Oh, you are? Oh, okay. it's, oh. it's only 9.25 p.m. It's early. There you go. Yeah. Still time for chocolate. It is, still, and, and I, I'm sorry I didn't bring my chocolate here. I, I actually got. I was going to make you jealous. I, I got for Father's Day. I got a beautiful a tablet of of uh, lemon ginger dark chocolate. Oh my god, I can't wait to taste. Oh, that, that. sounds. That I sounds thought great. about you, Anthony. I had dinner at this German restaurant locally, and they have like 600 different kinds of chocolate. So I'm going to go in there and buy a hundred dollars worth and ship it to you. So, oh, lovely! I can't wait. Yeah, yeah amazing. <laughs>
Very cool. All right, guys, that's a wrap. And until next time, my friends, keep, keep listening. listening. Enjoy the ride.